Hi, I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. In this video, I'm continuing my lecture series into theories of ethnicity and nationalism. We're on section 1.5 of the notes on page 10. If you want to access the notes, just click the link in the description field. It'll take you to the PDF. Use it to supplement your readings. We're, again, on page 10. Uh, with that, let's begin. This is section 1-5. Okay. Uh, so, bioethnical theories. Okay. Um, so, this is going to be uh, the four criteria for sociobiological fitness. So, what I want to do is I want to discuss the conception of bioethnical theories will talk about the justification for ethnical identity in terms of this sociobiological relationship, but I want to go uh, a little slow. So, number one, uh, kinship selection and inclusive fitness. Kinship selection and, and inclusive fitness are the conditions for social structures. That is, social organization is indirectly influenced by our biological genetic need to propagate our genes. And this is, I'm not sure of you how many know, how many of you know the, um, the discussion of the selfish gene. I'll talk a little bit about that in a bit. So let's go through and read number one uh, again, right? So kinship selection and inclusive fitness are conditions for social structures. So the idea is in... In the selfish gene, the analogy is, imagine that the gene is behind the wheel of a massive 18-wheeler truck. So the, the gene is in control. Our genes are in control, driving the truck. The truck is us, our body, right? The genes determine where our body goes, if you will, how to navigate our body. And it's the gene that's really in the driver's seat, right? Sort of that old cliched. Um, term being in the driver's seat, being in control. Our genes do that. With respect to the relationship um, with sociobiological fitness, the idea is rather simple. The idea is that our social structures are themselves a consequence, a result of our genetic predispositions, our genes, so that our genes and our biology determine our social structures. Our genes are in, and our biology are in the driver's seat when it comes to our social organization. So the idea is that it looks very simple. We have our genes, and we have our genes as the condition for our social structures. Such that we can say our social structures are a consequence of our genes. Right? So this is the rough this is a very sort of generalized account, we'll make it more specific in a bit, but our social structures are a consequence of our genes. That's what's, what's, what we should know at this point. So kin selection and inclusive fitness are conditions for social structures. That is, social organization is indirectly influenced by our biological genetic need to propagate our genes. So the idea is, is really simple. I watch, and I, I will always want to start sort of ghetto philosophy, keep it simple first, and then we'll complicate it later. So I watch a lot of, um, you know, Nat Geo, uh, anything having to do with the animal kingdom, stuff I like, be because there's so few left. Everything is basically endangered now. Um, plus, you get a good sense of our biological primacy, our inherent primal nature, which is covered by this veneer of society by watching sort of Animal Planet and Nat Geo and such. And one thing that I've seen in the, in the recent months that I think is, that exemplifies this perfectly, albeit, you know, the social structure of lions, is that you'll have uh, a male lion and a pride of lionesses, and he will father the cubs. And if a poacher comes in and the poacher kills the father, then 
new male lions will come and seek to father the next generation of cubs. So the question becomes, what happens to the existing cubs from the old dad? Without even considering it, the new male always, always slaughters, for all practical purposes, always slaughters the previous father's cubs. They all die. And the new male doesn't stop until he is satisfied that all of the old cubs, all of the old father's cubs, have been, have been slaughtered. This is a perfect example to explain this. Now, obviously, I, I don't know the level of cognitive understanding of, you know, lions. But the idea is I don't want that genetic, I don't want the, gen the genes of my competitor propagating itself for this next generation. So to slaughter the cubs is a preservation of his genetic pool, his genetic um, future and an assault on, a denial of genetic propagation of his competitor. And I think that's, I think that's, I think that's amazing. The social structure of the lion, that is, the structure in which it is an understanding, because the women, the female, the female, um, the female lionesses immediately go into heat once, once the old cubs, their old kids, have been slaughtered. Their social structure, this relationship between lions and lionesses, lions and lions, lionesses and cubs, this social structure, if you will, is clearly a consequence of the genetic predisposition to propagate one's own gene and to eliminate competition of other genes. It's, it, it's exactly what's at stake here. So if you can have a general understanding of that, how our social structures, our relationship to other people, our relationship within our family, our relationship within our kinships and our ethnicity, um, just like the lion's relationship with lions and lionesses and lionesses with cubs, our social structures are themselves a consequence. They are the condition by which our genes manifest themselves in the world. So our genes really still are in control all along, and our social structures though they seem to develop organically and intuitively are really determined to some degree by our genetic coding. So that's the idea, right? So that's number one, and I think that should be clear. Number two, social structures are merely survival machines that exist to maintain the fitness of genes. Social structures are merely survival machines that exists to maintain the fitness of genes, right? So, genetic fitness, without going into a gene discussion, and I was always fascinated by um, undergrad, I was initially going to study something in the natural sciences, and I almost, I almost completed um, course requirement, and then, you know, I got attracted to philosophy. And fitness is an interesting concept, right? So we recognize that, this is the very short version, I don't want to go off on a huge tangent, but we recognize that natural selection selects for strong um, characteristics of survival and selects against those who don't have the necessary characteristics. And there's any number of examples. So the canonical example is, imagine that we're somewhere in England and there are trees and smog is getting really bad in the city and it's a dark tree and a light moth like a white moth lands on the tree if the white moth lands on the dark tree the characteristic of being a white moth is selected against because it's easy to identify a light or white moth on a dark tree so all the birds come by all the other predators come by and they eat the white moths so the characteristic, the phenotypic characteristic of being a white moth, having that sort of pigmentation, is selected against. Now, the, the fitness of that characteristic is relatively low. It's very low. So that the ability to propagate that characteristic, that, that phenotypic characteristic of being a white moth, is going to diminish as long as those trees remain brown and they remain white. 
Now, because of pollution and other things, let's say there's a coating, right, of, there's a coating of, on the tree, and the tree's no longer brown, the tree's lighter. Well, now that the condition of the tree has changed, the fitness of that phenotype increases. Why? Because now the white moth is better able to blend in. And predation on the moth isn't going to be as extensive because camouflage has been increased by environmental changes. Um, so that the idea is genetic fitness in and of itself can only be assessed in relation to environmental conditions. And that's what's important, right? Genetic fitness in and of itself can only be um, can only be assessed in relation to environmental conditions. As environmental conditions change, environmental conditions transform the nature of the fitness of the gene. The idea is, and I think this is amazing, the idea is that our genes, whether this is true or not, you know, is probably open to discussion, but our genes are built to propagate itself, to increase its fitness. And the genius of the human species is that we just refuse to bow out of the game. No matter how toxic or how terrible our environment gets, we're going to create conditions so that we propagate our species. And the coolest, and I'm going to stop on this point because I can go off on this forever. <laughs> but I think the coolest thing, uh, you know, I've been seeing um, sci-fi, I think it's sci either sci-fi, I think it is sci-fi, has a series called The Futurist. Um, and I watched this episode on Mars and the colonization of Mars. You know, if Earth ever becomes toxic enough, you better believe human beings are going to find somewhere else in the solar system to live, right? So that this idea of fitness is going to inform our social structures and think about something as radical as the colonization of Mars. In my children's lifetime, maybe not in mine, but definitely in my children's lifetime, I would imagine that we're going to put somebody on Mars, like boots on the ground on Mars. It's going to happen. So, okay, we got a guy, we got a girl on Mars. No problem. Our social structure, the idea of colonizing another planet is almost sci-fi. It still is relatively sci-fi. The science is catching up quickly, but it still is relatively sci-fi. Think about how different that social structure is. If that social structure is a condition, not of just exploration, which would be fun, but if that social structure, that emerging social structure, is a consequence of the toxicity, the increasing toxicity of Earth, then there is no question we have to go. That's environmental pressure, just as I said with the moth, that environmental pressure is going to force us to transform the nature of our social structures so that we can continue to propagate our species. Um, and it could be as radical as leaving the damn planet. So there is some merit to this. There is some merit. There's quite a bit of merit to, and I'm, I'm biasing the point. I always try to give the best explanation of concepts. I don't particularly, and I hate saying this, but I, I sort of telegraphed it. I don't particularly believe in a lot of the bioethnical theories, per se. There's some aspects of it that I think are a little wonky, but it's not whether or not I believe it. It's me making sure that you understand it and explain it to the best of my ability, and I, I'm satisfied with my discussion and description of the first two. So, and I, I, I really shouldn't have said that I didn't support some of this stuff. All right, so um, top of page 11, this is now 2A. So the, prioritiz the prioritization and emphasis of ethnical relationships may itself be explained, right? The priori prioritization and relationships between the ethnical classes, ethnicities, may um, at least in part be explained by the biological need to protect and propagate our genes. Um, which ours socially? I don't know what that means, which ours socially? But our sociality, right? Our socialization, the process of socializing, and the social structures that we, this is sort of like one, um, and the social structures that we form are themselves consequences of this genetic, genetic need to propagate our, um, propagate our species. I, I guess at this point I am going to put a little bit of a critique here. Um, normally I don't do this, but I do want I do want to flesh this out because I'm very charitable in my account of any theorist or any theory. But one of the key problems you can you should be able to already sense is okay. I'll grant the argument that our social structures are consequences of our genetic predisposition to propagate our genes, 
but what is that causal relationship? It seems more like a correlation than um, a conditional relationship, right? It seems like there is a correlation between genes and social structures, but to say that, which would give you some degree of variance, right? There's a 60% relationship, or 70% relationship, or 80% relationship, or 40% relationship. But to say that our social structures are themselves necessitated by genes means that you have to draw a very, very definite distinction, a very, very thick line of demarcation from genes to social structures, and that can become very difficult. Like, how are you going to prove? I can see a correlation, because correlation is no demonstration of proof, but how are you going to prove that social structures are themselves directly conditioned by, gen by genes? That's the sort of logical problem that I have with this theory. The reason why I bring it up at this point is because the idea of prioritization, the idea of relational experiences, inter-ethnical relations, um, and inter-ethnical conflict, I mean, to boil all, inter and, and I'm not saying that theorists are saying this, but to, to even attempt to boil all inter-ethnical conflict down to genetic predispositions and genetic propagation is a bit of a stretch, for me, is a bit of a stretch. Okay. But again, you know, I'm not trying to defame or um, undermine the, the efficacy of this theoretical position. I just want to make sure that you understand what it is and some conceptual weaknesses with what it is. So number three, reciprocal altruism is the third criteria. So Ex, uh, I, I need to explain and conceptualize as generalization, masquerading as a universal truth, right? Explain and uh, contextualize as generalization, masquerading as a universal truth, and I'll explain what this means in a second. So here's the assumption. One, there is an assumption in this discussion of human nature, right? So there is an assumption that there is, that human beings have a nature, and philosophers have historically challenged that assumption. If there are universal characteristics for human nature, what are they? Um, what might they look like? And such. Number two, there is an assumption of absolute truth. There is an assumption that in terms of our genetic predisposition to propagate our genes, that it is, again, it is definitive that that is true. We're making the assumption that it is in fact, true, that that is true, that the genes themselves somehow are in the driver's seat. Now, I do obviously recognize that genes and our DNA and our species tends to increase and maximize its diversity. This might change with genetic um, manipulation and such in the future, but a key aspect that's that's almost always overlooked in a lot of these theoretical discourses on genes and sociobiology particularly, which I find to be very problematic, is it's a lot of um, nature and not a lot of nurture, right? It's almost lopsided. Environmental conditions are the means with which we assess fitness. You can't assess fitness in a vacuum, right? Genetic fitness cannot be assessed in a vacuum. You cannot just look at um, aspects of our genes and make assessments as to how those genes will manifest and the efficiency or the weaknesses that these genes will create socially until you look at its relationship to the environment, right? As environmental conditions change, these genetic fitnesses will change as well. So there's, uh, the fact that there is some absolute truth governing this, I think to me, moves a little bit more towards the spiritualistic and, and I'd rather keep it uh, sort of firmly contextualized within sort of a secular conception of um, this relationship. So number three, epistemic guarantees about future conditions. I'll talk about that. Um, denies or delegitimizes the possibility of intentional consequences as a product of egoistic motivations. Um, so, 
what in the world does any of this mean, right? The idea is, in terms of altruism, which is giving to others, right, to be altruistic is to give to someone else, right? To be egoistic is to think of self, and to be moderately, to be moderately altruistic is to sort of do this. And this is, they call it reciprocal altruism, right? So that reciprocal altruism, reciprocal altruism, Reciprocal or moderate altruism is sort of this the sharing concept. It's it's not wholly altruistic where all I am concerned with is the other person, which is one. It's not egoistic where all I'm concerned with is myself, which is two. It's reciprocally or moderately altruistic. It's uh, sharing. It's I'm giving to you, but I'm taking from you as well. I'm interested in the well-being of others, but I'm also thinking about myself as well. And this is this is great. The idea of reciprocal altruism um, is interesting to note within the context of our socio-biological um, predisposition. Why? And this is where it gets technical, so forgive me, um, forgive me if this seems a little too uh, abstract, it'll, it'll make sense in a little bit. Our genes, the argument says, our genes determine our social structures. Got it. One characteristic of our social structures that the authors find to be of relevance is our ability to live reciprocally, altruistically, with other people. It's a key component of our um, social structures, this give and take. The idea, then, is not to look at the social structures themselves, as in one, Right, as being a consequence of our genes, but to look at aspects or characteristics of our social structures as also being derived in our genes. So it's what's known as a hypothetical syllogism, right? So just so that you see this, it's called a hypothetical, just super quick logic, nothing too complex. Hypothetical syllogism. And the structure of a hypothetical syllogism is simple. If A, then B. If B, then C. Therefore, this triangle means therefore, if A, then C. So, if our genes are sufficient for our social structures, if our genes are sufficient for our social structures, and our social structures are sufficient for what? Our social structures are sufficient for um, reciprocal altruism, right? If our genes are sufficient for social structures, and our social structures are sufficient for a living in a reciprocal altruistic manner, then our genes are sufficient for living in a reciprocal altruistic manner. Then A, then C, right? So again, we've then we've then um, uh, deduced we've deduced the relationship and the quote unquote the legitimacy of the relationship between our genes and characteristics within our social structures. Not our social structure itself, but characteristics of our social structure. And this is the argument. So, it's good, argues the soci sociobiological theorist, that our social structures inform key characteristics of society those characteristics that propagate sort of cohabitation. Why? Because in the end, our genes are still in control. So that should be very clear now, right? Now, the assumptions of that are that there is a human nature, that reciprocal altruism is an aspect of human nature and not an aspect of individual people. So I have a problem with that. Normally I don't do this, so you'll have to forgive me, I don't critique so soon in the lecture, but I'm not gonna, I can't let that fly, right? I can't, there's, I just, I have too much, I have an academic obligation when I see a little bit too much, it's too a little, it's too ethereal, right? It's, to say that um, a consequence of our social organization is reciprocal altruism and that must be derived from our genes is a leap too far for me. I can't, 
I can't make that leap. I think you can understand the leap after my explanation, but I do not see the correlation even between genes and our gene coding and the act of reciprocally, altruistically living. I, I just don't see that. Um, number three, still in 3.3, three, the epistemic guarantees about future conditions is also difficult, right? Think about this as a critique, this is part of the assumption. Is there an epistemic guarantee? If you talk about our genes in our driver's seat, I think the metaphor is, is cool, but it would give our genes some cognitive understanding of future conditions. And to my knowledge, that cognitive ability to infer, not deduce, but that cognitive in ability to infer or to even intuit future conditions of truth is a consequence of our wiring. It's not a consequence of our genes, right? I think, uh, to my knowledge, I could be wrong, I could be completely wrong, but I, I seriously don't think I'm wrong. It's a consequence of our wiring. It's all of our um, neural wiring as a collective mass of wiring that allow, right? You have to have these sort of logical paths built into the brain as a consequence of habituation and training in order to be able to infer, right? To say that we can get epistemic knowledge at the genetic level just... And that it, there's some, you know, I just can't, I can't I'm sorry. <laughs> and forgive me, right? Forgive me if I'm, because I know there's a lot of um, um, sociobiologists and, um, what is it, bioethnical theorists that will probably, they're, they're probably skinning their teeth now listening to the lecture, but I just don't see how that's possible. I don't see how that's possible. I, I'll totally grant genetic fitness. I'll totally grant relationships to environmental conditions uh, as a main, if not seminal factor, influencing genetic fitness. I'll grant that. I'll grant that our social relations, I'll grant that our social relations as a consequence of social structures can be influenced by genes. Absolutely. The lion comes in and he devours the the prior lion's cubs. Our relationships can be defined genetically. I, I, I can go that far. But to say something like, but to make the move that a mode of interpersonal relationship can be, in terms of altruism, my ability to want to help others, um, can be isolated genetically, I would have to see the proof for that. I don't have to see the proof for that. So I think that's, um, I think that's clear. Number four is the concept of ethne, E-T-H-N-Y. The ethne is an extension of the breeding, quote-unquote. I, I do genocide theory, so anytime I hear um, breeding, I always think, you know, sort of, I put that in the context of, you know, sort of genocide, but ethne, an extension of the breeding population created by Endogamy, in which mate in which mate selection is confined to specific groups, right? And I, I mean, this is sort of obvious, right? It's sort of breeding intra group. So to be technical, it's intra group breeding. We breed within our ethnical community. You breed within your ethnical community. Obviously, I said, anytime I see breeding population with reference to people, I always think um, about arguments of purity always in quotes, I think about arguments and purity. Why? Because this sort of language has unfortunately um, historically been used to talk about contamination, like genetic contamination. Oh, if you breed with the blacks, you've contaminated yourself, right? If you breed with, you know, the Hispanics, you've contaminated yourself. Or even if, you know, if you breed with the whites, you contaminate yourself. So um, I've always been mindful of this. Why? Because <laughs> more than anything, anything having to do with sociobiological, it's a realization that we can reduce the social, and this is again not to critique this theoretical concept too much, but we already know as fact that we can reduce the sociological to um, a narrative. It doesn't have to be as, I don't want to, I don't want to say it pejoratively, sort of mythical, 
But we know that race and ethnicity is a myth. We know that these social constructs are exactly that. They've been constructed by our interpersonal human relationships, the concepts of race, the concepts of uh, the concept of ethnicity. Thus, if we're talking about sociobiological, the idea is to put a question mark around that socio. I get the biological. So are we really talking about a narrativized biology? Is that what we're talking about? We have to be careful, right? Because if that's what we're really talking about, you can see how, rather than saying a socio-biological explanation, a narrativized biological explanation would serve as the grounds for things like the justification of genocide and hokey pseudoscientific conceptions of purity of race and even more hokey and bizarre conceptions of the propagation of specific ethnical classes um, and specific ethnical gene pools for the betterment of civilization. I mean, this is what the National Socialist Party built um, the foundation of their extermination of primarily the Jews on this concept. So my point as a theorist, I have an obligation to make sure that I don't just let this fly under the radar. Yes, could sociobiological accounts for ethnical identification be true? Absolutely, it could be true. There are elements to this that are, that are genius. However, it is academically irresponsible not to acknowledge the, the, the ease with which you could pervert this theory for really, really horrific ends, right? We have to be very care, careful when we talk about biology in a very narrativized, general, mythological sense, right? We, we need to, we, where's the facts? Where, how did you arrive at this consequence? How is this conclusion justified? Not, you know, um, our genes determine our social structures and our social structures determine relational bits. Uh, therefore, our genes determine, you know, our relationships. Uh, if that's the case, then, you know, everybody who's ever done any bad in their relationship, you get a get-out-of-jail-free card because, you know, I couldn't have done it. What, what does uh, Shaggy say? Uh, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. It was my genes. You have to forgive me, sweetheart. It wasn't me. It was my genes. <laughs> that would be a great <laughs> if you could only do that in the real world. Okay, so the assumption of empathy is this concept grossly generalized. You have to forgive me because I know I'm going in on this. This is not my usual style, but I can sense while I was doing the lecture series, I had to incorporate it, but I, you know, it's, something about this rubbed me the wrong way, so I just, I'm hammering it a bit. So, again, please tell me why I'm so wrong and I'm not understanding the point and blah, blah, blah. I won't read your comments, but, you know, feel free to argue with the virtual me. Um, <laughs> this, this concept grossly generalizes heterosexual normativity as the main sole condition for our social organization. So this concept of empathy, right? The idea, the whole concept informing the justification for social structures as inherently determined by genetics reeks, unfortunately. And there might be new contemporary accounts of sociobiology, and please, you know, you know, learn yourself. Don't really inform me because I'm not going to read any of this. Um, but it reeks of heterosexual normativity. Yeah, Jason, you know, your example of the lions was really cool. However, I'm a lion that likes lions. Ah, damn it, never thought about that. <laughs> you don't like lionesses? Oh my goodness. No, actually, I don't. I don't like lionesses. I, I'm a lion that likes lions. Um, so you don't have to worry about me going to kill the cubs and the propagation of genes and all that other stuff. I love your Nat Geo example. Great example, Jason, but uh, I, I, I like lions. Damn, you know, that doesn't quite fit into my theory, so we're not going to talk about that right now. Again, to focus, we're talking about lions and lionesses. <laughs> well, that's a good point. <laughs> and that's precisely the point. We're talking about human interaction. What do you say about the enormous gay population that we have, right? Oh, it's a disorder. Oh, it's a disease. It's, it's, not, it's unnatural. You know, this is, this is academia. This, isn't, uh, this is not, no offense to people's theology and theological beliefs, but this is not a theology class. I'm not talking about the morality of being gay or it, should you do it or ought you not to do it. If your argument is that our social structures and all the characteristic aspects of our social structures, which is a little bit less viable, or even most of the characteristics of our social structures, are themselves consequences of our genes, one absolute, and number one, 
one absolute characteristic of our social structure, which is undeniable, is the fact that many people in our social structure, the globe over, um, I believe, were born to be gay. You can even, I, I would even grant that they've been socialized to be gay. Sure, I'll even grant that. The fact that they're homosexual, how do you tie that into the propagation of genes? Because it was their genes that made them homosexual, right? So if the argument is, if the argument is that the whole point of our genes is to propagate, right? Think about this. And actually, this is a really good point. Now that I think about it. This is actually genius. For myself. If the argument is that our genes determine our social structures and you disagree with sort of homosexuality is immoral or what have you, you have to, you have to assume, the person who disagrees with sort of the homosexual lifestyle, one, you have to assume the position that homosexuality is not genetic. You cannot assume that homosexuality is genetic. Now let's talk about theorists. So let's get rid of sort of sort of the layperson community. Let's talk about theorists because theorists are a little bit more intellectually sort of inclined. No offense to anybody, but so there is definitely a segment of the theoretical community amongst theorists that would say, "Well, no, members of the the gay population, I will grant, are genetically predisposed to being gay. Being gay is not a choice. Being gay is the way I was built. I am genetically." gay, right? So that's the argument. People say, oh, well, you know, being gay is a choice, or no, being gay is part of my genes. Let's assume those, and there's a ton, I'm sure, theorists who believe that being gay is genetic. Okay, let's talk about them now, to get even deeper. I didn't think I was going to get this deep, but it just clicked. If being gay is genetic, and obviously identifying um, a gay, quote-unquote, lifestyle is something that is absolutely identified within society, it's an aspect of our social structure, heterosexual relationships, homosexual relationships, aspects, key aspects of our um, uh, social structures, then my genes inherently are not conditioned to propagate themselves. Because it wasn't a choice. I didn't choose to be gay. I was built, well, well that, that severely undermines the theoretical argument. Severely undermines the theoretical argument. Why? Because it wasn't a choice. So the theoretical argument presupposes that genes are there to propagate themselves, use the lion example and killing all the baby cubs and blah, 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 and that's all good. Okay, what about the lion that likes lions? I'm genetically predisposed, I'm genetically determined to be gay, and thus my gene pool in no sense is going to propagate itself, and yet I am a consequence of my gene pool. If you can't answer that theoretical complication without defaming the homosexual community, then this is, this is hogwash. <laughs> this is smoke and mirrors. This is smoke screen. If your response to that in any sense defames lesbian and LGBTI community, then I'm, I'm not interested in any of this. Why? Because, oh, well, it's unnatural. I don't want to hear that. Oh, well, it's, uh, it's immoral. I don't even know what that means. I don't believe in morals, <laughs> per se. I mean, I do, but I'm not going to get into that. Okay, so, no, you have to give a theoretical account for the, the humongous, blaring contradiction that says our social structures are determined by our genes, by the LGBTI community, which is a definite proof that that is categorically false. And your argument cannot be justified by the defamation of the group. That's not an argument. You have to explain that caveat, and I just can't think of a theoretical, theoretical way that you can't. So, uh, I don't know. This is, you know, again, no offense to sociobiology, no offense to bioethnical um, theories. I do think they have good elements to it. Some of it is a little hokey. And, uh, and I never, I never go in and I'm, I, and to be honest with you, I'm not really bringing the fangs out. <laughs> I'm really not <laughs> because I don't want to just obliterate it on, you know, publicly. Um, so, I mean, do feel free to defend blah, blah, blah. If you want to argue against that position, you know, publish an article arguing against that position. If you want to defend that position, then, you know, argue an argument like I just argued. Right. But so th that, that heterosexual normativity assumption sort of, we have to, we have to be fair. 
So here's the logic um, in four. Let me get another swallow of my nectar of the gods. <laughs> so um, this assumption, uh, so the assumption, this con oh, I already read that, logic. Um, if genes are the source of our social relations and thus seek to propagate themselves via sexual reproduction, our social relations must seek to propagate sexual reproductions. Where such relations obviously don't, the argument collapses or, uh, or had to identify perversion, or has to identify perversion within the LGBTI community. So that's basically what I said. Obviously, I haven't formalized a, a proper logical argumentation because this is a freaking lecture series. But for those of you who are interested, because I'm not going to write about this at all, for those of you who are interested, use this as a, a springboard for publication. I mean, there's some really good debate that can be had here. You know, why am I wrong? Oh, he's wrong because sociobiology is more fine-tuned than he said. He was generalizing grossly. Da, da, da. Okay, fine. No, no, he's actually right. No, the problem of, or the assumption of heterosexual normativity is inherent in sociobiological, ethnical, bioethnical discourse, and thus we should scrap it, or we should relegate it to sort of a mythical, mythological status and not elevate it to the primacy it's assumed. Da, 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 da. Sure, no problem. The idea is I'm here to just get the discussion flowing. On my part, I do the hard stuff. Read the books, make sense of this so that you can make sense, and, you know, build a career on these concepts. Because I, I have. Okay. Uh, 4B. This biological fact is then socially reconstructed. Basic marketing 101. The new turbo turbocharged car. Lots of money equals greater potential for mate selection, so buy the car. What does that mean? Now, um, the social reconstruction of this genetic these genetic facts, and there is some correlation here, right? It's not to debase the entire argument. You know, you buy that $250,000 Ferrari, why? So that the girls will look at you, right? Obviously, again, I have to assume heterosexual normativity, right? Oh my goodness, oh, he's so cute, oh, yeah, he's gonna buy it. Well, I mean, that sounds a little sexist even though, right? But okay, sure, let's just play with the concept a bit. Yeah, so I buy the car for the girl, I buy the house for the girl, I buy everything for the girl, I buy everything for the girl. <laughs> Capitalism is built on heterosexual normativity. <laughs> right? and, and that's not a new argument. Feminists have been saying um, via Marxist critique, uh, feminist Marxist critique, that capitalism is precisely built on heterosexual norms, right? Because we do it for the girl. Um, I'm filming this now in sort of the Christmas season. The video will obviously go up around December-ish. And I can't tell you how many diamond commercials I see. Every other commercialist, get the ring for the girl, buy this from this jeweler, buy this from that jeweler, and she'll love it, and she'll smile, and she'll kiss you, and she'll be happy. Buy, 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 buy the stuff for the girl. And we do that, why? Because we want to buy it for the girl. Ah, oh, my LGB, I got you. My LGBTI community people, I feel your pain, dog. I feel your pain. I've been grinding with you since 05. <laughs> I feel your pain. Um, you know, there is, there is a huge, huge and probably growing community, um, not because of social inclusiveness, but I think um, no longer a fear of social repression. So, uh, you know, I am in the camp that believes that um, homosexuality is biologically determined. I believe some people choose it as a life, but I think overwhelmingly it's biologically determined. I was born this way. Um, you know, we have to, we have to be considerate. You know, we have to be considerate. And I understand that my position is probably way out there. I'm the, the liberal professor who's super radically inclusive. And yeah, I, to an extent, I am that guy. Um, but yeah, we have to make an account for that, right? So yes, buying the nice Ferrari in order to impress the girl is important. And yeah, that does motivate consumption in capitalist market economies globally. True, but don't think that um, homosexuals don't have a lot of... A lot of... Um, a lot of flexibility in their income. Don't think that they don't have um, discretionary money that they can spend um, because there's a ton of cash that they spend. You think capital is going to be biased towards heterosexuality? That was a good argument for a while, and it probably is still the case, but capital doesn't care about none of that. Capital doesn't... First of all, capital isn't real. It's an ideology. Capital cares about the propagation of capital. And if members of the LGBTI got a ton of cash that they're willing to spend, capital is going to accommodate what they need so that it can propagate itself more. And as far as I've seen, 
uh, it's doing a pretty damn good job, it being capital. So, again, I apologize if I'm just coming heavy on um, bioethnical and sociobiological arguments. Uh, there are some good bits, but I, it would be grossly inappropriate from um, an academic sense not to point out some of the potential um, problems with this theoretical paradigm. So, next. We create social structures, this is C, last bit on page four, uh, on page 11. Um, we create social structures, organizations, to satisfy our tacit desire for genetic dominance. Ethnical relations may preserve these sentiments. So, this, again, is problematized by what I said before, conceptions of purity and impurity. So, genetic dominance, yeah, I, I, I'm probably more inclined to, to see that. Why? Because genetic dominance, um, or dominance in general, is if there is a human nature, which I actually don't believe in human nature, if there is, and that's just my own personal bit, if there is a human nature, it's probably fiendish. Um, it's probably fiendish if you assume a moral position. Uh, and I don't even want to go into that. That opens up a whole... It's, I will qualify that a little bit, because otherwise there's no way for you to get access to what I'm thinking. In terms of evil, there are two characteristics, two macro-level categories of evil. Quick tangent. There's natural evil, and there is moral evil. Natural evil is what the lines do. Moral evil is the act of murder and war and da da da. So we have natural and moral evil. The idea is, however, if there is a human nature, um, to say that it's fiendish presupposes moral evil. When in fact it might just be a consequence of our genes. Some of the predispositions, if you really take genetics at heart, and you really follow the logical argument, I've been doing this for years, you really follow the logical argumentation to an almost reductivist um, substrate, foundation. And I'm not going to go off on a tangent, but this is good because it might spur some ideas in your head. You, that reductivist sort of logical deduction, conclusion, almost invariably always ends in a loss of freedom. And we end up having a very deterministic life where we think we have freedom, where we think we have choice. It really is the genes driving. So the attempt to preserve freedom, right, the attempt to preserve freedom, because we feel it, oh, I'm going to do something free right now, I'm going to drop this marker. Well, you know, Jason, no, you, the way you're wired and the logical brain that you have and your genes, you were going to drop that whether you wanted to or not. Okay, I don't want to believe that. I want to believe that I have freedom. So the intent, I mean, the attempt to preserve freedom and yet account for the determination of social structures genetically is a little bit of another contradiction. So, I mean, irrespective of the heterosexual, homosexual discourse, if that's something you don't want to dabble in, there's another level of problem, there's another um, problematic. That problematic is the, um, the seemingly contradictory position of saying that our genetic dominance, or the, the dominance of our genes, the efficaciousness of our genes, is so pervasive that it determines, determines, not influences, but determines our social structures. Yet, I'm still free? Well, where did that come from, right? If it determines our social structures, aren't we not free? And if we're not free, shouldn't we empty out the prisons? Or at least say that, you know, we are willfully incarcerating people who had no control over what they were going to inevitably do? It starts to sound a little hokey, right? So, again, I know I'm doing a generalization of this. I know the theoretical standpoint is probably far more rigorous than this. However, however... Because I'm a genocide theorist, I've published in the field, um, I know how this concept is used as um, a pervasive means of excluding and exterminating others. Because they're contaminating the good genes. Um, that, that is a very dangerous, that is a very dangerous and very powerful narrative, which is why... I reduce, personally, sociobiological theories to narrativized biological theories because our sociality is itself already constructed. Ideas of race are already mythological. 
ideas of ethnicity are already mythological and hence narrative. Thus, we're telling a story of our biology. When it comes to biology, when it comes to genetics, I like to get my biology and my genetics from biologists and geneticists, right? So that's how that goes. <laughs> and I might be overly cautious. Oh, that's the end of that. Um, I might be overly cautious, uh, so forgive me if I'm overly cautious on that. Uh, and that, that was quick. That concludes section, what was that, 1.5? Um, and I apologize. And now that I think about it, I just went in. I must have been upset. I don't know what happened the, the day I made these notes of I had a point to prove or to destroy destroy theory. Um, but destroying theory is fun, right? I mean, why not? You know, people spend their whole lives building nice theoretical paradigms, and sometimes you need to destabilize it a bit so we can reconstruct it and make it stronger. That's part of the game. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> I definitely won't be reading the comments. I'm sure there's a whole bunch of people that uh, establish their careers on um, uh, bioethnical theories and sociobiological theories. And, and there are valid, there are points of validity to it, but we need to be very careful as social scientists about the generalizations that we make and the attributions of power that genes exert over everything uh, and, you know, sort of rein in some of the more grandiose assumptions about the influence and determination of our genes. Um, with that, I want to thank you for watching this rather blue, brutal section, uh, 1.5. Uh, thank you, and have a good day.